John leaves work early to go home. They're having a party at their house tonight. From a conversation with his wife, it's clear that their relationship is strained. Their seven-year-old son, Nathan, asks his father if their relationship with mom will ever get better. John reassures the boy that it just takes time. But in any case, he loves him and will always be there for him. Moreover, he suffers from diabetes and needs constant insulin infusion. News about the approaching Clark Comet is broadcasted across all media. But John doesn't take it seriously. His wife asks him to go to the supermarket as guests are coming soon and they're short on supplies. John and his son head to the supermarket. Suddenly, he receives a voicemail informing him that his family has been chosen for rescue from the impact and they need to come to the collection point. John rushes home. Friends and acquaintances are in the living room watching TV, where they show a fragment of the comet reaching Earth. It falls into the ocean. People discuss what they saw and reassure each other that nothing bad will happen. But then John hears strange noises. He runs out of the house and sees a flock of restlessly squawking birds. The ground shakes. Returning home, the men see terrifying news about fragments falling in their state. A part of the comet, the size of a football field, caused severe destruction. A city where 400,000 of its inhabitants lived disappeared from the face of the planet. People are shocked. Then another message comes, also broadcasted on TV. The couple's friends are outraged, wondering why only the Goretti family was chosen. Everyone rushes home, hoping they also received the coveted code on their TVs. John and Allison pack their belongings and the family heads to the specified point. Friends try to give their child to them, but John refuses to take the girl. He realizes he can't help everyone. The Giretti's car makes it to the airport. At the gates, there's armed security as a huge crowd is also determined to fly out from the doomed place. The family gets inside, and then John discovers that his son's backpack is missing insulin. It's left in the car and the father heads back. At that moment, soldiers notice something is wrong with the child. Learning that the boy is sick, they apologize and firmly state that in that case, they won't fly anywhere, as sick people are not needed in the new world. Allison tries to persuade those responsible for boarding, but in vain. The female commander explains that the rules are the same for everyone, and 90% of the guards' families are left at home. Hers, too. Allison resigns herself. John returns to the airfield with insulin, but can't find his family. He doesn't know that his wife and child are already outside the gates and walking to the car. A military officer orders boarding and tells John that if they're wearing identification bracelets, they must already be on the planes. Since all of them are flying to the same place, John will be able to find them upon arrival. The man boards the plane, but one passenger, Seeing insulin in his hands, wonders how they were allowed on with a sick child. John realizes something is wrong. He asks to be let off the plane, and the rear hatch opens. Outside, there are screams of people and orders to the military to hold the perimeter. Those who were denied salvation have broken into the airfield. A refueler is killed, and fueler is killed, and fuel spills onto the ground. John realizes the danger and shouts for people to save themselves. Chaos ensues on the field. People running, gunshots, and what John warned about happens. The fuel ignites, and planes start exploding. Meanwhile, Allison and Nathan are walking to their car. The boy is scared, but his mother reassures him, saying that dad is on another plane. They reach their car and realize they can't get out. Nathan starts feeling the lack of insulin. Allison decides they need to find medicine and get to her father's house. The woman writes a note and leaves it under the car's wiper. John finds it and is relieved. His family is alive. The mother and son walk down the road. Ahead is a supermarket. They enter and find medicine for the boy. But at that moment, armed people burst into the building and start shooting at everyone. Allison and Nathan try to escape. One of the militants spares the mother and child and lets them out of the store. 
They run to the parking lot and see a woman getting into a car. Allison asks for a ride, and the driver agrees. Meanwhile, John also tries to catch a car to get to his father-in-law's house. He sees a small truck, and the driver agrees to take him. In the truck's bed are several men. One of them notices John's airplane pass bracelet and says people are selected by profession. His mother, a doctor, was also chosen. He knows the planes are flying to Greenland, and there's a chance to get there on planes carrying ordinary people from a small airport in Canada. Other neighbors listen to their conversation. At that time, the man who took Allison and Nathan in his car takes her bracelet and throws her out of the car. Allison is in despair. She's lost her son. In the truck, a passenger approaches John and says he doesn't deserve the bracelet and must give it to him. A fight breaks out, and eventually, the men fall out of the truck bed. John comes to his senses on the roadside. His opponent attacks him again with a hammer, but John, taking his weapon, kills the attacker. Their fellow travelers watch them. John is horrified. He's killed someone, an unthinkable act for him. At that time, Allison tries to stop a passing car to get to the airport, where her child's kidnappers went. When they approach the cordon and try to get inside, the man orders the child to say they're his parents. But when the boy faces the soldiers, he says they're not his parents, and the bracelet was stolen from his mother. The military takes the child, and the criminal couple is arrested. Allison is picked up by foreigners, who take her to the airport. She tries to find her son and is led through the sanitary tents. Finally, she sees her son, and there's no limit to the mother and son's joy. John makes his way into a stranger's house, where there are no owners. He eats and turns on the TV. The news is horrifying. The whole world awaits inevitable doom. The man finds car keys and heads to his father in Law's house. At the elderly man's house, friends have gathered. The men play cards and drink. John arrives. Allison's father says he doesn't know where his daughter is, but hopes the man will find them. From their conversation, it's clear that John cheated on his wife because of family problems. The elderly man says he hopes for a reunion and restoration of the family. Meanwhile, Allison and Nathan ride a bus. Getting off at a stop, Allison calls her father and reports her location. The men go to pick them up. They find them, and everyone is happy. The family is together again. In the father's house, they watch the news and learn that in 14 hours, the largest piece of the comet will fall, starting the apocalypse. John remembers the fellow traveler's words and orders his family to get ready. They drive to Canada, to the airport from which ordinary people are evacuated to Greenland. Allison's father refuses to leave. He lived here with his wife, and from here, she went to heaven. The old man wants to die in his home. John respects his decision, and the man calls John his son. Farewell scenes. The daughter realizes she's seeing her father for the last time. The Giretti family heads north. They talk about how life shouldn't flash before one's eyes before death. People should value life here and now. The family listens to terrifying news from around the world and remembers meeting their parents, laughter and tears, sorrow and joy. They realize both are to blame, and family is the most important thing in life. On the road, the family is caught under celestial bombardment and barely escapes. Here's the airport. John, Ellis, and Nathan make it to the last plane. They practically blackmail their way onto the board. People in the cabin move, holding children in their arms. They try to help as much as they can. The pilot brings medicine to treat John's wounds. And now the plane flies over Greenland. Suddenly, comet fragments start falling. One passes very close. The plane loses control. But the pilots do the impossible. They land the plane, but they die themselves. Before dying, one of the pilots points John to another plane landing nearby. People head in that direction and find a bunker. They descend into it. On the surface, the apocalypse begins. 
The earth shakes. Lights go out. The Giretti family hugs each other. They are together, and that's what matters. Parents remember the bright moments of their lives, their home, parents, the birth of their son. Nine months later, radio stations broadcast call signs. Greenland, Helsinki, Sydney, New Delhi, Moscow, Sao Paulo, explosion-proof gates of the bunker open. The long months underground are over. People come to the surface and see the sun.